Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Let's get right to the latest out of Ukraine and breaking news this morning. Ukrainian officials announcing a new temporary ceasefire with Russia to allow more civilians to escape. The two countries agreeing to six routes out. This after a similar effort yesterday allowed thousands of people to get out of the city of Sumy. Despite this pause in some areas, overall Russia is intensifying its attacks on Ukraine with devastating effects on the people still in the country. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky saying relentless shelling has killed hundreds of civilians, including more than 50 children. And along the western border of Ukraine, the humanitarian crisis is growing. More than two million refugees have fled the violence, according to the UN, many of them forced apart from their loved ones. The hardest part to understand that we are now safe here and our friends and family are not safe. The British Defense Ministry says Russians have closed in on several key Ukrainian cities, but Ukraine forces have kept Russian troops out of the capital of Kyiv. And a defiant President Zelensky speaking to British lawmakers yesterday echoed the words of another wartime leader, legendary Prime Minister Winston Churchill. We will fight till the end at sea, in the air. We will continue fighting for our land, whatever the cost. Here at home, President Biden is moving to ban U.S. imports of Russian oil and is sending two Patriot missile batteries to Poland to support NATO allies. But the U.S. rejected an offer by Poland to transfer custody of Soviet-era fighter jets for delivery to Ukraine. There's a lot to get to this morning. We have a team covering it all, including NBC News White House correspondent Carol Lee. We're going to start in Ukraine in the western city of Lviv with NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter. So, Molly, Ukraine said it evacuated 5,000 people from Sumy yesterday. This morning, the government has agreed to a ceasefire with Russia along six humanitarian corridors. So how are the evacuations going today? Is the ceasefire being observed? Hey, Joe, good morning. That's right. So we've heard from the Ukrainian side, from the Red Cross, that confirmation, as you mentioned, that 5,000 civilians got out of Sumy. That is not nearly at the numbers that humanitarian organizations want to see. So we are now looking at five different humanitarian corridors, including out of Sumy again and that southeastern city, Mariupol, which we've been talking about so much. In addition, a sixth route that includes five suburbs of Kyiv that actually goes into the center of Kyiv. Now, the ICRC is actually the one brokering this talks is on uh, hand in all of these cities to try to open up those humanitarian corridors. The problem, Joe, all week and over the weekend is that the Russian shelling has not stopped in the exact places where civilians are known to be evacuating. Joe. So, Molly, I want to focus more on Kyiv and the situation in and around there. We know the region is seeing heavy fighting. Are we getting closer to a potential conflict in the capital itself? Yeah, Joe, when you look at a map, it is no mistake that the Russians are shelling Sumy very heavily. They have been shelling Irpin very, uh, very heavily, where our colleague uh, Richard Engel has been, where civilians have been trying to evacuate. It's been really dramatic pictures. Those are strategic routes into Kyiv. And so as the Russian shelling increases, those are also why humani humanitarian corridors are being talked about in those areas. Now, we know from the Pentagon yesterday, uh, a senior defense official says that the Russians are now trying to get in through a third access uh, point to Kyiv. As of now, though, that convoy that we've been talking so much about, it's 40 miles long, 15 miles away from the city, hasn't made that much progress, Joe. And Molly, you also mentioned Mariupol. It is one of the hardest hit cities in Ukraine. What is the humanitarian situation like over there right now? Joe, it's devastating. And we've been talking to MSF, Doctors Without Borders, who has staff there, the ICRC, the International Committee for the Red Cross, as we mentioned, who's brokering and facilitating these humanitarian quarters. They have staff on the ground. Now, according to the Red Cross, uh, more than 200,000 people are in dire need of getting out. They have been living without electricity, without water, without heat. It is completely unlivable. The latest on that evacuation is that eight trucks, 30 buses filled with humanitarian aid, Joe, were going into the city yesterday. Uh, we heard reports that there may have been an incident, there may have been Russian firing on that convoy. The idea was that once that humanitarian aid, badly needed humanitarian aid, got into the city, that civilians would then be able to load onto those trucks and buses and get out. And Joe, I just want to say anecdotally, as you mentioned, I am in Lviv, in the western part of the country. We have been meeting refugees all week now, talking to them about where they have been fleeing from. 
We haven't met anyone from Mariupol. And, I, and I'm sure, look, I'm sure people have gotten out and made it to the west of the country. I haven't met anyone from Mariupol. And that speaks volumes about perhaps how hard it is to get out of that city right now. Molly Hunter in Lviv. Molly, thank you so much. Let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Carol Lee in Washington. Carol, good morning. So let's begin first with President Biden's decision to ban Russian oil imports. So, I mean, gas prices were already at record highs before this move. Now this could send an average gallon of U.S. gas past $5. What's the White House saying about concerns over how this will hurt Americans, as, as many Americans really just kind of start to see the repercussions and realize this? Yeah, right, Savannah. Well, the president said yesterday that, look, this is going to cost Americans more, that this is something that they're already experiencing pain economically from, and that it's only going to get worse. And, and look, this was a significant shift for this White House. This is not a step that the president was overly supportive of just a week ago, but he came under a lot of pressure from Congress to do this, a lot of pressure from Ukrainian President Zelensky. And part of the reason why the president decided to do this was he was either going to be forced to do it by Congress or he could come out and take credit for it and do it on his own. Mm -hmm. But there's a belief that the country is behind him on this, and particularly Republicans. And that, in the sense, would give him political cover for some of those price increases at the gas pump that you were just talking about. Take a listen to the president yesterday. This is a step that we're taking to inflict further pain on Putin. But there will be cost as well here in the United States. I said I would level with the American people from the beginning. And when I first spoke to this, I said defending freedom is going to cost. It's going to cost us as well in the United States. Republicans and Democrats understand alike understand that. Republicans and Democrats alike have been clear that we must do this. Now, look, this is, this is something that the White House doesn't know how far will it, Americans are willing to go mm. in terms of their tolerance for these high gas prices in order to inflict pain on Putin. But the president, again, feels like he has some cover. And what you heard from him yesterday, Savannah, was interesting. There's a little bit of shift in the president's message here. And we've written about this on NBCNews.com. And that is to blame Putin for these gas prices, because this is a political issue for mm -hmm. him. So we heard him step out and place this squarely mm -hmm. on, the pres on President Putin. And that's something that we're going to hear more of going forward. Now, Carol, one important point here also is, you know, the European Union and the United States, United States and its NATO allies have really been in lockstep when it comes to moving forward here with what to do in terms of sanctions. Well, the European Union did not join America on this ban. They're still heavily dependent, in fact, on Russian gas and oil. Without an EU ban in place, with a lot of the world still dependent on Russia's oil, does the Biden administration think this ban is really going to have the desired impact on that country? It's not going to have the impact that it could, Savannah, if Europe joined with the U.S. in this. But what we heard from the president and other White House officials is that they understand why the Europeans aren't willing to take this step necessarily right now, that there's a momentum to eventually get there, but that they're not ready to do that because this would really hurt the European economy. And also, you know, they might want to be careful what they wish for anyways, because if Europe were to take that step, it could have a ripple effect on the, just the global economy. And so it could have blowback here in the United States as well. So the U.K. said that they are going to phase out their dependence on Russian oil through the end mm -hmm. of 2022. There's others who are looking at doing this in the future. And for now, the White House is saying, that's OK, we understand. Carol, I also want to ask you about something else that's going on here, a little bit of a rift again with, between NATO nations. It has to do with those fighter jets being supplied to Ukraine. So yesterday, Poland made an offer to have the U.S., this gets a little confusing, take custody of those Soviet-era fighter jets and then have those jets transferred to Ukraine. Earlier this week, the White House had signaled their hesitancy towards a deal of this sort. Yesterday, the Defense Department basically just rejected this offer flat out from Poland. I just heard a member of Congress explain this a little bit ago as an unfortunate miscommunication, but walk us through this decision. I mean, why does it seem that Poland wouldn't just give them? It seems like nobody wants this sort of direct responsibility. That's absolutely right. And this has become sort of somewhat of a hot potato where you have Poland and the U.S. kind of saying, no, it's yours, no, it, no it's yours. And what happened here is that Poland said they're willing to do this. The U.S. said they're willing to do this publicly because this is a demand from President Zelensky. So no one wants to say no to this mm -hmm. because they've already said no to a no-fly zone. So they're trying to figure out a way to make 
this work, but there's not a lot of appetite for this for, for a couple of reasons. It's really difficult logistically to get the planes there, you've heard from administration officials. And also there's fears of escalation, that Vladimir Putin would see this as direct involvement by the U.S. or Poland and essentially NATO in the conflict in Ukraine and take it out on NATO allies. So the U.S. had expected that Poland, if this was going to go forward, would move those planes themselves to Ukraine. And instead, Poland said, no, we'll send them over to a U.S. military base in Germany and the U.S. can do it. And the U.S. Mm -hmm. was caught off guard and said, hey, this is not what we expected. Carol Lee, I think a lot of our viewers have been confused by this, especially as they continually hear President Zelensky call for a no-fly zone, need these types of weapons. So thank you so much for that explanation. Let's get to Clint Watts for more on the situation on the ground. He's a distinguished research fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and an NBC News national security analyst. Clint, good to have you with us. Let, let's start with the evacuation routes that Molly was reporting on a few minutes ago. Walk us through where these routes are and what the plan is to try and get more civilians out. That's right. So what we're seeing in, in terms of the refugees, the numbers grow every day, but also the humanitarian corridors offered by the Russians were absolutely ridiculous. They were essentially pushing folks into both Russia and Belarus, the countries that are attacking them. The one that has opened up is essentially here. You're seeing people try and move from Kharkiv to Sumy or into this corridor from Sumy to this town here big problem with this is that ultimately they're still in harm's way. This is becoming basically a, a population center that is going to be overloaded. And when you look at the bigger picture here, you're seeing Russian forces start to advance all the way down into here. Dnipro, uh, Dnipro is where we think they're trying to move both from the north and the south. You're just moving populations around on a very mm -hmm. long and extended journey to a place that may fall into those hands again. I, your reporter right before this, as I was coming on, was talking about not seeing folks from Mariupol, uh, just not seeing a lot of them. This town is completely under siege and decimated. In all of these eastern cities that are close to the Russian border, they've seen heavy conflict. I think the big thing now is you're seeing dehydration, starvation, no electricity. They, they are exposed. They're in the cold. This is winter still in Ukraine. It's a very dangerous situation for anybody left behind. I mean, Clint, can you talk more about what the situation is like on the ground and around Mariupol right now? What are you seeing there? Sure. So in the south here, some key notes. The, the Russians did this initial advance right here. You also saw them come in from Russia. And in this area, they're basically surrounded. You're seeing massive heavy indirect fires, uh, aviation, everything's being used against it. Separately, you're starting to see the Russians put together their own logistical convoys, but those aren't supporting the humans that are inside these towns. And you're starting to see them try and push to head north. We saw this was the nuclear plant we were so worried about last week. Now you're seeing them trying to push even further north. They will be completely cut off. There will be no resupply either from sea or from land. So it's going to be an absolutely dire situation for anybody that's left behind in this area. Clint, while we have you, I also want to ask you about the Patriot missile batteries the U.S. is sending to neighboring Poland. These are defensive weapons. Tell us, what do they do and how could they most effectively be used? Why is the U.S. taking this step right now? Yeah, so you probably remember Patriot missile batteries, if you're old enough, from the first Gulf War. Essentially, they are there to intercept ballistic missiles that are surface to surface uh, that come from, let's say, inside Russia into Ukraine. They're trying to do the same thing, which makes sure that any Russian missiles that are out there that can be interdicted don't enter into NATO territory. When you look at the bigger picture here along this Polish border, they're worried because there are supply lines essentially moving from here in Poland into Kiev and from Kiev, or into Lviv and from Lviv into the Kiev, into Kiev. The western part of Ukraine essentially is becoming supply routes. You have foreign fighters drift in. I'm sure NATO is worried. How do we protect against any indirect fire that might be coming in from surface to surface missiles, from aviation? One of the ways to sort of send a signal to Putin and the Russians is to put Patriot missile batteries right there on the front lines of NATO. All right. Clint Watts, thanks so much for walking us through so much of that. We really appreciate it.
Now, we're hearing more stories from the front lines of Ukraine this morning as thousands of residents try and flee to countries in Eastern Europe. Yeah, the humanitarian crisis continues to unfold in refugee centers near the borders of Ukraine, but regular citizens and people from all over the world are stepping up to help out in any way they can. One of those people is Terrell Germain Starr, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. Terrell actually joined us two weeks ago, as you may remember, from Kyiv as the invasion was just getting started in Ukraine, driving in his car with his friend who was signing up to fight. Andre, I believe is his name. He's been helping people get out of the country. And now today, he's near the border in Uzgorod. Ter Terrell, thank you so much for being with us again today. We actually know that you just traveled all the way to Lviv, that's that far western city, to help a Ukrainian woman leave the country so she could get medical treatment in Lithuania. Tell us about the journey. Tell us about what you encountered on the way out of the country and, and what it was like to help her out. Thank you very much for having me. So first of all, um, we, we the person, her name is Irina, and uh, we escorted her and her family to Lviv where a, uh, um, where a bus bound for Lithuania uh, was set to take them and dozens of other people out of the country. And so what is that journey like? Well, getting from Kiev to Lviv, generally speaking, if you're going on a train, for example, would take about six or seven hours. But on the road and given the circumstances and the dozens of checkpoints, roughly about 30 of them that you have to go through um, on your way there, makes that trip more like a day and a half. So. What we saw was uh, sirens constantly going off, uh, not knowing exactly where you were going to stay, because it's not a matter of money. It's a matter of mm -hmm. can you find a home or a group of people who are willing to open up their, you know, to, to who have good hearts, that are open up to, to give you a room. In our case, our midpoint was Ternopil, which is two hours outside of Lviv. And so this family fortunately had an entire apartment to host myself, Andre, and Irina's entire family. Mm. And so what it really depends on right now to get to, to, to basically take refugees from Kiev, from these hot points to the border, are open hearts, uh, a lot of local knowledge, a lot of local language, and just goodwill. Because once you get out of these hot zones, you still have a very challenging road ahead. And it's all based on contacts and, and goodwill. Mm. Thank goodness for those helpers all along I mean, the yeah, way. Wow. I mean, Terrell, I mean, over the last couple of weeks, tell us about any of the people who you've met who just really stand out, some of the stories that really have inspired you over the last couple of weeks. Well, it starts off with Andre. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm a working journalist myself. So in addition to covering this uh, war, this, this Russia wage war against Ukraine, uh, I'm also deciding that I'm going to in, uh, to involve myself in the humanitarian efforts of moving people out. What you see is a country that has decided to unite against Russian aggression, whereby they say that, <clears throat> excuse me, we are not going to get on our knees and succumb to Putin's abuse. Andre is a prime example of that. At first, he started off as, as a member of the territorial defense units. Once he realized that his role there was not as effective as he could as it could have been, he moved into you know from holding a Kalashnikov to escorting people, you driving hours upon hours nonstop from Kiev to one part of the country. And again, it's a very taxing thing. One part of this that people don't understand is that uh, you could usually go to, from Kiev to let's say Uzgorod or Lviv with one tank of gas. Because of the checkpoints and that you have mm. to idle for hours on end, you may have to go through three or four tanks of gas wow. for one trip that ordinarily will require one. So it's expensive. And so you have people yeah, like absolutely. Andre who are not rich, who are not wealthy, or who are going out of their way to assist. So he's in a prime example of that. And somebody who took his own family to Poland for safety, but he stayed behind. Well, he has to stay behind because he's a man. And if you're between the ages of 18 and 60, Ukrainian government will not let you cross that border. And so while he is there, he's making ample use of his time. Ugh, absolutely. I was actually going to ask you for an update on him. So that's so great to hear, Terrell, that, that he's safe. Terrell, what is your plan now? I mean, do you intend to keep on helping people move out of the country as things sort of deteriorate there? What's next? Yeah, so I am going to continue to be here in Ukraine. I am going to assist as many people as possible logistically to get 
from whatever point to the other, particularly those who are in Sumi. I'm deeply concerned about them, these uh, African students, the for, you know, the Indian students, the, the, the foreign students who are there, I'm, I'm definitely focused on helping them logistically to get from point A to point B. There are a number of people here who are willing to help them, but the people who need the most help don't understand how to connect. And so I'm using my platform in order to help do so, while at the same time working as, a, as an independent journalist to, to capture these stories, to capture video, and to document these cases of how people are coming together and how people are escaping Putin's brutality. Terrell Jermaine Starr, thank you so much for everything you're doing and for keeping us updated. And, and please uh, continue to check in with us throughout everything you're doing there in Ukraine. Take care. Yeah, we definitely want to keep thank you. hearing. Thanks, Terrell. Now, the U.N. estimates more than two million refugees have now fled Ukraine since the invasion began two weeks ago. More than half of those two million have entered Poland. And there's no sign that flood will end anytime soon. NBC News senior national correspondent Jay Gray joins us now from a refugee processing center in Poland. Hi, Jay. Good morning. Good to see you again. Now, when we saw you yesterday, we know you were at the border. Thousands were crossing into Poland on foot. Many of them then moved to yeah. places like where you are, again, a refugee processing center. Tell us what you're seeing at a location like this. Yeah, and Savannah, we want to give you a first-hand look at what those refugees uh, come to when they cross over the border. Uh, this is an area in Zheshov, about 60 miles from the border, where people have uh, made their way. And, and it's kind of a waypoint for all of these uh, refugees that are continuing to pile in. But I want to show you what's been done here and tell you a little bit about it. Uh, they have a lunchroom here. This, two weeks ago, was a shopping mall. This was an area where people would come and, and buy different goods. It's been transformed by one man, a doctor here in Zhezhov, who said, I've got to do something. I, I've got to make something happen. So he's now got this lunchroom. You see, they've got catered meals here. They've transformed this entire place in two days. He brought crews in, construction crews who did the work, installed showers and bathrooms. And I'm going to walk you down this way and, and show you what else. This place is unbelievable. 800 beds, but they continue to move people through. He installed a washroom with washers, dryers. People can do their clothes. How desperately is that needed after you've spent some people 50 hours trying to get here? You move down the way. When the catered lunch is in here, they've got another area where there's some food, some microwaves, some fruit, so people can have that. And then one of the biggest deals and one of the things they're using the most here is this area. It's a 24-7 medic area doctor on call constantly savannah it's amazing to see what so many people are doing for so many people that so desperately need it yeah absolutely i mean we're calling it this refugee processing center it's a refugee processing center that didn't exist days ago because there weren't millions of refugees crossing over into this country it's right. amazing to see what they've done jay i want to ask you though about some reports of you know some of the chaos here i mean as this gets more and more desperate there is this visa center yeah. a uk visa application center with large crowds waiting in freezing temperatures for hours before ultimately being turned away yeah. What are you hearing about this? Yep. What are you hearing as it does start to get more chaotic? And also, if you could walk us through what a refugee has to do before they can, you know, if they're somewhere like that trying to get a visa, they get to the border, before they can move on from a shelter, a camp, a processing center like right. where you are, to more stable housing elsewhere in Europe, when does this end for people? Yeah. Well, they, they've got to show their papers crossing into the border. Now everybody's allowed in, but there's still the, the idea that you've got to uh, show that and let people know. I, I heard from a, a person yesterday at the Medica crossing where we were who, who said it took 58 hours from the time he got there to get through the processing, and he said the crowds are growing exponentially there. So once they're through there, and, and, and that's a madness with thousands of people moving everywhere, uh, then they've got to wait on a, a bus. Uh, to get them to a train station. They've got to be able to get a ticket on that train. And remember, at each one of these stops, you're seeing hundreds, if not thousands, of people with the same mission, to get somewhere, to do something, to find a place to lay their head. And that's what this is. This center is available. People can stay two days, kind of get their thoughts together, figure out where they're going to go. They've got counselors, volunteers here uh, that are also helping in that process. And then it's right next to a train station where uh, people are... Uh, led to the train station and, and they provided a ticket and allowed to then uh, 
move on. So, so this is just a, one of those places, really, Savannah, where you, where you decompress from, as you described, a, a process that takes days. I, I mm -hmm. talked to a, a person here today who said they traveled 50 hours just to get to the border, started by car, wasn't going to work, no more gas, and had to walk for days just across the border. So to get here is such a relief for so many. Yeah. Absolutely. Jay Gray, you have been bringing us these incredible scenes of desperation from the border, but now some scenes of people just helping yeah. people out in an amazing way. Jay Gray, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Stay right. safe. Look, more breaking news coverage on the war in Ukraine and also look at some of the other news today. Coming up, the grim warning the lawmakers on Capitol Hill on the war's growing threat to America, plus other dangers to look out for. Also guilty on all counts. More on the first ever verdict against a January 6th rioter. That's all next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. We'll have more coverage out of Ukraine coming up as efforts to evacuate more cities get underway this morning. But we do want to get some other stories that are making news this morning. Yeah, U.S. intelligence officials offered grim warnings about Russia's invasion of Ukraine during Tuesday's House hearing on worldwide threats. First, let's listen to some of that. Our analysts assess that Putin is unlikely to be deterred by such setbacks and instead may escalate. We assess Putin feels aggrieved the West does not give him proper deference and perceives this as a war he cannot afford to lose. Putin is angry and frustrated right now. He's likely to double down and try to grind down the Ukrainian military with no regard for civilian casualties. NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now with more on this. Ken, good morning. So, I mean, those are just some pretty frightening assessments. And they touch on a few things that have sort of been these open questions. How will this end? What's going on in Putin's mind right now? We just heard he cannot afford to lose. He may double down. What else came out of that hearing and how concerned should we be for what's to come in Ukraine? Good morning, Savannah. After listening to those intelligence chiefs, I would say extremely concerned. They were very clear this is going to get ugly. And those were some of the most candid assessments mm -hmm. of Vladimir Putin's mindset that we've heard from U.S. officials. You know, Bill Burns, who's the CIA director, was once the ambassador to Moscow. He's been dealing with Putin for years. And he painted a picture of a guy who's increasingly isolated from reality, a narrow circle of advisors, extremely frustrated, but prepared to double down, even though all the assumptions that Putin made about how this war would go turned out to be wrong. He thought he was going to take Ukraine in two days, mm -hmm. these intelligence chiefs said. And Avril Haines, the director of national intelligence, pointed out that Putin did not anticipate this level of international sanctions from the world and also the pullback from private firms who are acting without sanctions, McDonald's, Visa, MasterCard, Starbucks, just pulling out of Russia. All this has come as a shock to Putin, but it's also left him in a position where he feels like he has no choice but to double down, Savannah. Yeah, I want to ask you a little bit more about, you know, how this could potentially end. I mean, first of all, the U.S. estimates up to 4,000 Russian soldiers have been killed so far. It's just a matter of weeks. That doesn't seem to be a deterrent here. So I want to play something House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff said following the hearing about what it might take to end this conflict. Let's listen. One thing Putin does fear is the ability of the Russian people to rise up against him. I think until he feels uh, that his own uh, regime is at risk, uh, it's hard to see him looking for an exit ramp. Do intelligence officials agree with that? Would pressure from within Russia deter Putin? But then, I mean, also, what, what's the reality of that? I mean, their, their media is completely controlled there. It doesn't seem like a lot of the Russian people even know what's going on. Well, you asked exactly the right question, Savannah. They do agree that pressure would deter Putin, but they're not seeing much evidence of it right now. Putin has created a regime of, with layers of control. He's got control of the oligarchs. Their money is beholden to him. And he's got control of a network of strong men and intelligence services that protect him with their lives. And you've seen him on the opposite end of those long tables mm -hmm. uh, meeting with advisors. You know, that, there's been speculation that's about his fear of COVID. But in recent days, I've been hearing other people say, 
say it's more than COVID that he's worried about. He's very concerned about his own safety, but he's also taking steps to assure that safety. And I didn't hear anything out of that hearing that suggested that the U.S. intelligence community believes that Putin is in any real danger mm -hmm. right now in terms of pressure from inside Russia. Yeah. All right. And now a reminder, this was the worldwide threats hearing. Russia is not the only threat at this moment, though, of course, it's a pressing one. This document from U.S. intelligence also listed China, Iran and North Korea. Climate change also made the list. Tell us more about these other threats. Yes, if we weren't in the middle of a horrific war right now, those threats that you mentioned would have gotten a lot more attention. Mm -hmm. This was about as stark a portrayal of the threat from China to U.S. national security as I can remember seeing in one of these documents. And this document for years focused on the threat from international terrorism, which obviously has receded, and we didn't see much about it in the document yesterday. China led the list. China is expanding its military, its nuclear forces is continuing to attack the United States through cyber and steel intellectual property, North Korea, Iran also using cyber, and a really stark assessment of the threat, obviously, from global pandemics. There could be another one. And climate change. You know, the intelligence community has been warning about climate change for years as a threat to national security. And they said it again yesterday. This is something we all should be paying attention to as a threat to U.S. national security. Savannah. Ken Delanian, as always, thank you so much. The first January 6th rioter to go on trial was found guilty on all counts on Tuesday. Guy Reffitt, a Texas man who tried to storm the Capitol, was convicted on five counts, including obstruction of an official proceeding and transport of a firearm in support of civil disorder. Jurors began deliberating yesterday morning after a week-long trial and reached their verdict in two hours. The most damning evidence against Reffitt, his own recordings, both before and after the riots, where he discussed what he planned to do and later what he did. More than 750 people have been arrested in connection with the January 6th attack. More than 200 defendants have already pleaded guilty and have been sentenced. Reffitt's sentencing date is set for June. His wife told reporters they plan to appeal. It is now time for your weekly checkup. Yeah, NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar joins us to discuss the latest health headlines you might have missed. First one is a bit of a talker here. A new yeah. study shows that <laughs> lead from gasoline lowered the IQ about half the U.S. population. In fact, for people born in the 60s and 70s, the IQ loss was estimated to be up to six points for mm -hmm. some, more than seven Glad I don't have a car anymore. What more can you tell us yeah. about this? All right. So first of all, let me say that these are just estimates, okay? Nothing concrete here. And let me secondarily say that any exposure to lead is really not considered good. It's a neurotoxin. Mm -hmm. There could be acute effects as well as more chronic effects. This applies to people who were born before 1996 because at that time, there was a ban that gasoline could contain lead. Previous, prior to 1996, gasoline actually contained lead, and so this was inhalation exposure. And as you mentioned, they measured the lead levels in millions of Americans. They found that over 50% of them had a level that was higher than the upper limit of normal, correlating with a potential loss in IQ points of about two to three points for the average population, more if you were born or when I was born in 1970. So, but here's the, here's the take home. If you're sort of in the middle to the upper range on the IQ spectrum, one to two points is probably not going to make a difference. But if you're lower on the IQ spectrum, this can make a significant difference. Mm -hmm. And more at a population level, we're talking about increased risks of dementia and heart disease and things like that. So super important. Thankfully, something was done about it. None of us likes to wake up and hear stories like this when we know that it could theoretically pertain to us, but there's nothing you can do about it now. Right. So no so doctor's no orders. Doctor's orders. <laughs> 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 Just, you know, you maybe take one of those free online tests. <laughs> yeah, check exactly. out where your IQ scores are. Yeah, it's going. <laughs> if you're in the age group. Okay. Here to make you happy. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for a nice little graphic yep. with the folder. Nothing. Okay, all right, doctor. Now, of course, we've all gotten quite used to being about six feet or so apart from each other. Yes. Everybody has their personal space bubble. People are kind of feeling anxious as people start to get closer to them. How much space do we really need? Tell us about this anxiety people are feeling. Right. So first of all, I have to give credit to these researchers at Mass General because they had the foresight to actually measure and, and look at this before the pandemic oh, wow. and during the pandemic. Okay. And they found that, in fact, people's personal space requirements increased by about 
40 to 50 percent wow. after the pandemic. And think about it. It makes sense. Pre-pandemic, it was about two to three feet. But then constant, all this messaging, we did it. Social distancing, all yeah. these fears, everything. And believe it or not, just like everything in life, guys, there's a neural trigger for this. There's basically a neural network that's activated by anxiety and danger. And that then triggers movement. So you almost have a reflex mm. to move away from things. I think it's really neat. Doctor's orders is this. Even though it might have expanded, we still have to honor that people have personal space boundaries. We all have it. And a gradual re-exposure to people to being closer. Do you guys do this in line? Like if you find someone standing closer, oh, yeah. you're like, mm -hmm. whoa, buddy, yes. what's going on? Yeah, I'm like, but, where have you but, been right, for two years? We can re-acclimate. We can get used to being closer to one another again, but it's not going to be an on-off switch. All mm -hmm. right, let's quickly tackle this yeah. last one. A new study says the more we drink, the quicker we age the brain. Researchers at Penn found moderate drinking may cause risk to the brain. So how many drinks are we yeah, talking moderate. about? Moderate. Right. And so here they were talking about, so talking about one unit of alcohol is about half a drink and they said basically if you went from one unit to two units that's basically a one one serving for a woman two servings for a man you lost about two years of brain function brain life yeah but they basically were saying they were correlating the number of drinks you had to brain volume and that volume was a correlate for cognitive function you look perplexed by this savannah <laughs> well, i'm just seeing and, one drink on that well, slide and i'm like Shoot. right and i would also like to add that that brain volume doesn't necessarily correlate with brain function but it, what we know that alcohol can have deleterious effect on brain cells so i think it's just mm -hmm. another reminder to us not to be drinking so much and of course doctor's orders are you know exercise do things to, you know, divert your attention away from alcohol. I'm so glad I'm making you laugh this morning, Savannah. So and, if you want a glass of wine, get on the treadmill. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> to offset that and be persistent about your non-drinking. Yeah. All right. yeah, that's my take home. So less booze, less gas. All right, we're good. Yes. <laughs> Just, yeah. all right, Dr. Azar, thank you so much. It's always so fun, especially when you're on set. Yes. Now, let's get a check of your morning news now weather. Bill Karens is with us. Bill is very high IQ. Bill, good morning to you. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, I think I have a big brain volume, but she said that doesn't mean anything. I mean, I can, like, a big brain volume, but it just doesn't do anything. So, I don't know. We'll have to get that investigated. So, uh, unfortunately, some serious weather overnight. That's what our lead story is. Uh, we had a tornado warning for downtown Mobile, Alabama in the middle of the night. Sirens going off. We had a confirmed tornado. It's heading towards the airport. Thankfully, it dissipated just in time that it did not do a lot of damage. So that's great. We still have some active tornado warnings, though. One just to the southeast of Columbus, Georgia. Georgia. Tornado watch continues until 1 p.m., so another active severe weather day in the southeast. Then to the north, just a messy morning commute. Everywhere you see in blue and white, that is snow. So areas of Ohio, I-70 from Columbus towards Pittsburgh, and then some State College. The snow is now breaking out throughout much of Pennsylvania. We will see that snow moving into New York State and much of New England as we go throughout the rest of the morning commute. New York City, Philly, D.C., all rain for you, Baltimore, too. You may see some snowflakes mix again, but it's going to melt when it hits the pavement, so it might as well be rain. And as far as severe weather goes, 6 million people are at risk. Gusty is strong winds up to 60 miles per hour. As we mentioned, isolated tornadoes are possible. So Myrtle Beach, Charleston, Columbia, Savannah, our friends down towards Tallahassee, all at risk of severe weather today. And this is how it plays out in the northeast. We're going to see snow likely mixed with that rain till about 5 or 6 p.m. in the New York area, and then it's over with. Same for you in Hartford, Boston, it's not going to end till probably around 8 or 9 p.m. this evening, just to help you out with your timing for anyone heading back home from work. Snowfall map, it's funny, the blue on this map, the dark blue, kind of highlights the higher elevations of the Berkshires. You can see northern New Jersey where there's some higher elevations, Pennsylvania, the Catskills, the southern tier of New York. Those are the areas that will get that up to three inches of snow. Everybody else, maybe just a slushy inch. And as I said, that'll be on the grass and on your car, not likely on the roads, especially treated surfaces. So the forecast today, the hot weather's in Florida. That's why we're going to have those storms. And then another Arctic outbreak begins. Billing 17 today. Denver only 22 with snow, so it's not pretty in the Rockies. And then that cold air is on the move Thursday, guys, into areas of the Midwest. And guess where it's heading for Saturday? Here. The Northeast. New York. And at the same <laughs> time as a rainstorm arrives from the south, just wait till I tell you the weekend forecast oh. for New England. Uh, 
it's not going to be pretty. Okay. Oh, wow. Well, Thank you for the warning. Wonderful. A lot tea to look forward felt. to with my big brain. <laughs> yeah, <volume>. yeah. <laughs> Everybody, stick around for it's full the of forecasts and bad news. All right. From Bell Thank, Thank you. you Bill. Coming up on Morning News now, sharing her story. Yeah. After the break, we'll be joined by a Ukrainian tour guide, now refugee, as she live streams her experience fleeing from the violence. That's next. Welcome back. More now on our coverage of the invasion of Ukraine. A Ukrainian tour guide is finding a new audience as she live streams her journey fleeing her homeland. Olga Dudakova's virtual tours of Kyiv usually attract between 30 and 100 people. But after the Russian invasion started, she drew larger audiences with nearly 2,000 people tuning into her videos. Some have even asked her questions live. Olga Dudakova joins us now to tell us more about this. Olga, good morning. Thank you for being with us. First of all, just tell us how you and your family are doing it and what it was like for you getting out of Ukraine. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Olga, and currently I'm kind of refugee. It's a strange word for me to pronounce now because mm. um, I left normal life, and I was a tour guide in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. Everything changed uh, in a moment, instantly, on the 24th of February. And uh, I live not far away from the area which was heavily bombarded uh, just from, uh, from the first day, the first day of invasion. Uh, we spent in Kiev two more nights with my kids. And when uh, I just saw that it's unbearable to sleep in the shelters, in the bomb shelters, because uh, we couldn't kind of naturally sleep there. There is the basement in the house, and uh, you could stand or sit there. Uh, and we decided to to flee to to escape Kiev at least. Mm. And that decision was very heavy for us to make because uh, we are a family and we have apartment to leave. And then uh, under when it was and shelling underway, I was managed to take just. A, very essential things. And uh, yeah. it's funny, but I have shoes, different shoes. I fled in different shoes. Uh, nothing I cared about, nothing just to escape, to, mm. to be in the safe place. Yeah. And uh, at first we moved to the central uh, part of um, Ukraine, to the other region. And then we um, we just crossed the border and uh, we in another country. we in Hungary currently. Oh, well, you're so... Happy that you made it there safe. Thank you for sharing that journey with us. I know it must have been quite difficult. Let's talk now about those live stream tours. One was titled A Small Town to Hide from Bombing. That was after leaving Kiev on this journey. Tell us about why you wanted to share this experience and what it was like. Uh, so I, I, at first I wanted to scream. So at the first date, uh, when, the, um, when the war started, yes, this is the exact picture of that date. I wanted to scream to the world that something terrible is happening. So that yeah. that never has happened before. This unjustified and unprovoked uh, attack, uh, it's changed the destiny of so many people in, in Ukraine and it's unbearable. It's impossible to, um, to, to be seen on the 21st century. That is why I started, I just launched my first tour on the first day of the war. It was kind of, I was making it in a shock. I was very frightened, I was scared, and um, I wanted to scream for help. This was my kind of, this tour was my scream for the audience, because I really have great audience uh, to show around the world, to see and to, to, to reach people. Uh, and then I started my touring, virtual tours, from the places where I stayed as a refugee. At first, in my own country, at first in Ukraine, the first tours were made from there. And then I moved to Hungary, and uh, I'm continuing to stream from the place where I'm <coughs> currently staying. This is my story. Mm. Oh, Olga, we are grateful for you sharing your story. We are glad that you are doing okay and wish you all the best as you continue to share that story with everyone. Olga, thank you so much. Coming up, Americans bracing for more pain at the pump as the U.S. bans imports of Russian oil. We'll have more on how the cost of war is being paid here at home. And reliving the trauma, Ukrainian Holocaust survivors in one Brooklyn community reflect on the war unfolding overseas.
This morning, a look at the impact on gas prices and the economy after President Biden's announcement that the U.S. will no longer import oil from Russia. NBC News business and technology correspondent Joe Ling Kent joins us with more on that. Joe, good morning. Joe, good morning to you. President Biden's new ban on Russian oil has triggered more sticker shock at the pump today. Although Russian oil only accounts for about 8 percent of U.S. supply, Americans are at the mercy of global prices. That has President Biden warning drivers, you'll keep having to pay more. This morning, gas prices are breaking records again. The national average hitting 4.25 a gallon, eight cents more than just yesterday. And President Biden warning, there's more to come. It's gonna go up. When asked what he can do about it, <laughs> can't do much right now. Russia's responsible. After announcing the new measures, taking aim at the heart of the Russian economy, we're banning all imports of Russian oil and gas and energy, and the American people will deal another powerful blow to Putin's war machine. The president making the announcement after rare bipartisan pressure to stop the flow from Russia. Ukraine's President Zelensky expressing his gratitude to the U.S., calling it a strong signal to the rest of the world, saying the import ban of Russian oil to the U.S. will weaken the country economically, politically and ideologically. President Biden telling Americans to brace for even more pain at the pump, but also warning oil and gas companies not to exploit consumers or pad profits. Russia's aggression is costing us all. And it's no time for profiteering or price gouging. The U.S. ban comes after impassioned requests. Ukrainian parliament member Oleksandra Ustinova telling Savannah last week. The president of the United States is protecting them from paying extra 20, 30 cents for a gallon of gas. And that's why so many Ukrainians have to die. Though many Americans say they support the ban, it also means gas prices continue to skyrocket. I shudder to even think about how much it's going to be for me to fill them. On Wall Street, another volatile day of trading as oil prices climbed yet again after President Biden's announcement. The pressure on Putin intensifying as Americans feel the fallout at the pump. As for how high gas prices could climb, I know everyone's wondering about that. Well, we've got summer driving season on the way, and experts we talked to say it's hard to predict the prices since the situation in Russia could, of course, change significantly, as well as the situation in Ukraine, all of that affecting the price of crude oil. But by Memorial Day, the national average could be as much as 50 cents higher than it is today, with similar prices or higher, I hate to say, mm. for the 4th of July holiday, guys. Wow. All right. Joel and Kent in L.A. Joel, thank you. The world's financial markets are taking investors on a roller coaster ride. Today, analysts expect some small gains after yesterday's dip. Yes, yeah, NBC reporter Silvana now joins us with more on what we can expect from the markets today. Hey, Silvana. Hey, guys, good morning. We're going to start with what's going on over with Russia. So McDonald's, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola and Starbucks and General Electric are the latest Western brands suspending business in Russia. The companies had faced international pressure to do so, and McDonald's will temporarily close 850 stores but continue paying its 62,000 employees. It has been in Russia since 1990, before the Soviet Union collapsed. Meanwhile, PepsiCo will halt sales of beverages, suspend investments and promotions, but will still produce milk, baby formula and baby food. GE is partially suspending operations except for essential medical equipment and existing power services. Oil prices are giving up overnight gains after Brent crude, the international benchmark, topped $130 a barrel. The moves coming after President Biden announced a ban on imports of Russian oil and fuel products. There are signs buyers are already shunning Russian oil. Gold, which is seen as a safe haven asset for investors, also slipping today, but still trading above $2,000 an ounce, the highest level since 2020. Europe is rallying and Wall Street appears headed for a higher open as stocks look to snap a four-day losing streak. And Bitcoin is surging back above $42,000, boosting the rest of the crypto market. The spike coming after remarks by Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen were published inadvertently. They revealed President Biden's executive order on cryptocurrency, which was announced this morning. It would take a constructive approach to regulating the industry. The president's order has attracted attention due to speculation wealthy Russians could be using Bitcoin to bypass Western sanctions. Joe and Savannah, back to you. All right, Silvana, thank you so much. Thank you. You got it.
Brighton Beach, New York, is a community in Brooklyn known as Little Odessa. It's named after the port city in Ukraine, and on the streets you hear Russian and Ukrainian more often than you hear English. Within the large Russian and Ukrainian Jewish community, emotions are running high as the war in Ukraine rages on. We spoke to people in the neighborhood, including Holocaust survivors, about how the news is impacting them. Stores along Brighton Beach Avenue are waving Ukrainian flags, propping up signs that say, Stop Putin, and putting up QR codes for charities supporting Ukraine. Brighton Beach is home to the highest concentration of Russian-speaking immigrants in the U.S. At a Jewish community center nearby, Russian and Ukrainian seniors can be found playing games, dancing, and reading local newspapers in Russian. The war in Ukraine is ever-present among this particular group. It's impossible for me to watch any of this without tearing up and crying immediately. My heart is bleeding. I'm seeing how they are annihilating the city and annihilating the people of the city. Many of these seniors are Holocaust survivors and are watching the latest news out of Ukraine with a deep sense of fear and shock. I don't know a single Jewish senior whose family went through the Holocaust and who immigrated from the former Soviet Union where they did not have an easy life, who doesn't report, I cannot sleep. My whole life is flipped upside down. It's terrifying. Many of the Russian-speaking Holocaust survivors and the Ukrainian Holocaust survivors are experiencing and reliving trauma and this is triggering PTSD from their wartime years. In 1941, Hitler's forces were moving into Ukraine. Pavel Iverbuk says he made it on the last boat out of Odessa when he was just six years old. I'm remembering the bombings and fear from the fact that at any second they could destroy us and a bomb could hit our house. It's a terrifying feeling. Even at six years old, I was completely petrified by the sound of the bombs. A Russian missile strike that appeared to target a TV tower in Ukraine's capital on March 1st struck the vicinity of the Babinya Holocaust Memorial, a site where more than 33,000 Jews were killed over a two-day period. Holocaust survivor Vladimir Bravarnik has relatives who were murdered in Babinya. They hit Babi Yar. It was simply like a punch to the heart. I cannot fathom how it's possible to survive World War II, this major war against fascism, and then afterwards turn around and attack your own people. Anatoly Sukarukov was evacuated towards the end of World War II from Moscow to River Ural. He is deeply disturbed by Putin's claims that Russia's military action is being taken to, quote, denazify Ukraine. That's a lie. That's a complete, total lie. Putin is playing on the feeling of Russian people who hate the Nazis. All of these people survived the Holocaust. Now they are seeing their homeland ripped apart by war. For the older generation of people who are Jewish, to them, this is what they were afraid of. And this is what they were screaming and fighting and giving up their lives and their family members gave up their lives for never again. As Holocaust survivors in the little Odessa area watch the news unfold, they're thinking about ways to help. I love America. I love New York. We are very worried about Ukraine. We're very worried about the people dying. We're thrilled to be in this country. And if there's any way to help, we would love to help our brothers. I think one of the most striking things there is hearing them speak both Russian and Ukrainian. You know, it's this area that knows each other. There's family on either sides, and there's just so much hurt also both on either side. It's such an important perspective. I'm glad we were able to tell that yeah, story because it, it's so close to home. It mm -hmm. reminds us how many people are impacted by what's happening exactly. in Ukraine right now. Yeah. That does it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.